our general concern is, is to discover as much as we can of the meaning of the phenomenon Socrates, of the life and, and the teachings of Socrates. So in a sense, we're trying to become, at least for a little while, the students of Socrates. And to accomplish this with the help of the, the Platonic dialogues, we began with, with Plato's really matchless portrait of Socrates as a teacher. Socrates' encounter with Alcibiades, that, that incredibly talented but also very controversial fellow, it led us to seek out Plato's account of Socrates as a teacher of justice in particular. And by far the most famous, the most complete account of Socrates as a teacher of justice is found in the Republic. Now, on the basis of that dialogue, we can most safely say, I think, that Socrates is less concerned with, with promoting any doctrine, let alone what we today might call a, an, an agenda or ideology, than he is with, with fostering self-reflection and therefore a certain self-doubt. He's concerned with teaching us, in the first place, what the fundamental questions are, and only then what the serious alternatives might be in answering those questions. Well, let me take an example from the Republic. Socrates is at pains there to point out the confused character of our attachment to justice. We hope or, or believe that justice is at once the greatest possible good for ourselves, what in the language of the Republic is called the health of one's own soul, and we believe that justice is somehow the good of others, of a whole greater than ourselves, to which we rightly dedicate ourselves and for which we're even willing to sacrifice everything, to give up our very lives. We believe with, with Glaucon that justice or morality is the single greatest good and that it's that for the sake of which we should be willing to give up everything good. What's more, thanks to Thrasymachus, we were forced to consider the possibility that justice is not in fact good at all, but pure sacrifice and not for any, any noble cause, but merely for, as Thrasymachus puts it, the advantage of the stronger. Now, with today's lecture, and in fact for the next six lectures, we're going to continue our examination of Socrates as a teacher, above all in contrast to his greatest competitors or, or challengers, you could say. And these are the sophists on the one hand, and the rhetoricians on the other. Now, there certainly were established schools in ancient Greece. Plato himself had one. But there really weren't universities in our sense or colleges. And many young people, at least young people of some means, received at least a part of their formal education at the hands of, of sophists or rhetoricians. These were itinerant teachers who offered advanced education in subjects both theoretical or practical, and they offered them for a fee often a very, very large fee. Today, we're going to meet the single most famous sophist of antiquity, an historical figure named Protagoras, after whom Plato named the dialogue that we're concerned with now. In a nutshell, we're particularly interested in discovering more about the nature of Socratic education by observing the contrast that Plato draws between it and the education that Protagoras has for sale. Now, my remarks today are going to fall into three parts. First, I'll make some introductory remarks about the Protagoras and its somewhat curious opening sections. Then, second, I'll discuss Socrates' first conversation with Protagoras. Then third, and finally, I'll look in some detail at the myth the Protagoras tells, uh, the myth for which the dialogue is, is rightly famous. So let's turn then to the beginning of the text of the Protagoras. What do we see from its, from its surface? Well, to begin with, the fact that it is a performed dialogue. That is, it reads just like the text of a play. And the two speakers in this little play or drama are, of course, Socrates, and then an unnamed comrade or companion. We, we never do learn his name. And Socrates, it turns out, has just come from a long conversation with the world-famous sophist Protagoras, as the unnamed comrade quickly learns. Now, this comrade knows enough about Socrates to know that he's been spending time with our old friend Alcibiades, 
Alcibiades, by the way, is present throughout the main action that's narrated in the dialogue. And in this way, the Protagoras is part three of Plato's four-part account of Socrates' relations with Alcibiades. We remember that the fourth part is contained in Alcibiades' drunken speech uh, in the symposium. Now, the unnamed comrade here asks, in effect, uh, how are things going with the two of you, if you know what I mean, Socrates? The speaker assumes, wrongly, that Socrates' interest in Alcibiades is a sexual one. And this comrade seems, in a way, more interested in gossip than philosophy. It's true, he he is eager to hear the details of the, the conversation with Protagoras that Socrates has just come from. But this means that he hadn't heard a word of of the arrival of the sophist. He's the only person, in fact, we meet or hear of in the dialogue who hasn't heard the big news that Protagoras has hit town. In fact, this is already his third day. The comrade hasn't heard it. Now, I suggest that the person to whom Socrates addresses all that follows is certainly well disposed toward Socrates, but he's not at all philosophic. He doesn't run in the sort of philosophic circles of Athens. And I think this fact probably affects the frankness with which Socrates tells the story that he's about to narrate. And the rest of the Protagoras, some 65 or so pages, consists of Socrates' narration to the unnamed comrade of the day that he has just spent with the famous sophist. The dialogue is therefore a narrated dialogue with a brief performed dialogue at its very beginning. And that's a somewhat curious structure. I'll say a bit more about it a little later. So how did Socrates come to converse with this Protagoras, this superstar? It turns out that a young fellow of Socrates' acquaintance, Hippocrates by name, banged on Socrates' door before daybreak on this very day, barged into Socrates' room, and asked one of the world's most foolish questions, Are you awake or are you asleep? This this hot-headed and somewhat impetuous fellow is eager to have Socrates introduce him to Protagoras, who's just come to town. A fact, of course, that Socrates already knows. And this young fellow, Hippocrates, wants to study with Protagoras. By the way, it never occurs to Hippocrates that he should study with Socrates. Now, Socrates, in his sort of unflappable urbanity, even at 6 a.m., he doesn't get angry at being awakened. But he does tell Hippocrates that it's really too early to go to the home where Protagoras is staying. And so he passes the time by pressing Hippocrates as to precisely why he wants to study with the sophist, and so that he might become what exactly? After all, as Socrates says, it's clear why we might study with a doctor or a sculptor, so that we could become a doctor or a sculptor ourselves. Socrates asks, do you yourself want to become a sophist, Hippocrates? And here we're helped by the the action or the drama that I always stress. Because here, young Hippocrates blushes. He concedes that he would be ashamed, he says, to become a sophist himself. And this, I think, is the first, or at least the most obvious clue, that there's something fishy about the sophists. They may well offer something useful to learn, but to become one oneself? No thank you. Now, rather than press this line of attack, Socrates instead immediately offers Hippocrates a way out. Well, maybe you want to study with Protagoras, the the famous sophist, in the same way that you study with teachers of music, grammar, and so on, to be an educated, free person, to receive, as we might say, a well-rounded liberal education. But, so far from, from getting Hippocrates out of a tight spot with this suggestion, Socrates has, in fact, just backed him into a, into a tight spot. Because Hippocrates knows or believes the Protagoras is wise, and that he himself would like to have that wisdom too. But he's completely unable to state clearly in what that that wisdom consists in, or even what its subject matter is. All that Hippocrates can come up with is that apparently Protagoras can turn you into a clever speaker. But again, a speaker about what? Hippocrates doesn't have the first clue. And here, let it be said, Socrates really lets Hippocrates have it. How can you be so reckless, Hippocrates, as to seek out a transformation of your soul? Because that's really what education amounts to. 
without having a clue as to the nature of that transformation. Now, if we ask ourselves what the drama, the action of the Protagoras involves, I think it's clearly this. Socrates attempts to steer young Hippocrates away from becoming a pupil of Protagoras, or if you like, to save him from having such an education. And this permits us to see, I think, one reason why Plato chose to begin the dialogue with Socrates' conversation with the unnamed comrade, that is, with the performed part that frames the narration. The comrade thinks, remember, that Socrates is involved in a somewhat improper relationship with the young Alcibiades. He'll soon learn that, far from being any kind of corrupter of the young in any way, Socrates here saves the young from corruption, from, from the likes of a Protagoras. And so in its way, I think, the dialogue to Protagoras is a kind of apology of Socrates, that is to say, a kind of defense of Socrates. Well, the scene now shifts to the home of a famous Athenian named Callias, who was a very wealthy man, notorious in a way for the amount of money that he spent on Sophus. Sophus are expensive. And in fact, not only Protagoras, it turns out, but many other wise men are said to be at his home, including two other famous Sophists, one named Hippias, uh, after whom, by the way, Plato named two dialogues, the Hippias Major and the Hippias Minor, they're called, and a fellow named Prodicus. So he's, his home is stuffed with these Sophists. There's also a good number of very prominent and promising young people, uh, and these are already there when Socrates and Hippocrates arrive. These promising young people include Carmides, who was Plato's uncle, and the two sons of Pericles, the great Athenian statesman. Now, uh, Alcibiades and his friend Critias also arrive shortly thereafter. In brief, this is a very promising venue for Protagoras to attract prospective students, that is, ambitious young people who can also pay the high tuition. And it turns out, as we'll see, that the contest between Protagoras and Socrates proves to have some fireworks when they get together. Now, we've got to keep in mind, I think, that the entire conversation Socrates goes on to narrate took place before an audience, a fairly elite or, or rarefied audience, it's true, and, and one in a private home, but, but an audience nonetheless. And though Protagoras first takes the conversation with Socrates and Hippocrates to be a wonderful opportunity to advertise his wares to this, this great crowd, to put on a kind of infomercial, if you will, it gradually becomes clear to Protagoras and to us that the conversation is becoming a source of keen embarrassment to him that's in a way damaging his business pro prospects in Athens. Not only, I think, with young Hippocrates, but with everybody present. Why it proves to be so damaging to him, we'll have to see. So, without further ado, let's turn now to consider Socrates' initial approach to the great man, Protagoras. Now, Socrates does indeed introduce Hippocrates to the sophist, just as Hippocrates had wanted him to do. How Socrates introduces him is, I think, worth quoting, because it's, it's one indication of the subtlety with which Socrates speaks especially when he's speaking not to a naive young fellow, but to an aged and to a very sophisticated sophist. So here's how, how Socrates introduces the young fellow. Quote, Hippocrates here is a native, that is, of Athens, of a great and prosperous house. And opinion has it that he, he himself is, as regards his nature, a match for those of his age. In my opinion, he desires to be held in high regard in the city. And he supposes that this will come to pass for him, above all, if he should associate with you, that is, with you, Protagoras. Now we have to ask, what information does Socrates really conf convey to Protagoras here? First, that the young fellow is rich, not to put too fine a point on it. He comes from a prosperous house. Second, opinion has it that he's on a par with those of his age. Fairly limited praise, I would say and not presented, it's important to see, as Socrates' own opinion. The only thing that Socrates does present as his own opinion is Hippocrates' ambition. He wants to be powerful in the city. Now, Protagoras is immediately willing to take the student on. 
And that's a sign, I think, that he's in a way less interested in the boy's nature, his suitability, than he is with the fact that his checks won't bounce. And the politically ambitious, like Hippocrates, for some reason seek out Protagoras's company. We're going to have to try to figure out why eventually. Now, Protagoras's response is surprisingly long and complex. He launches into an account of how he differs from all other sophists. All of them, he argues, tried to hide the fact that they were sophists, claiming to be music teachers or gym teachers. Whereas he, Protagoras, proclaims that he's a sophist. His name, by the way, means roughly something like first to speak out. Now, the other sophists used what he calls cloaks of one sort or another. He doesn't. But this isn't quite correct. To be more precise, what Protagoras says is that admitting he's a sophist is a better, quote, precautionary measure than attempting, usually unsuccessfully, to hide the fact. And then he adds this remark rather cryptically, quote, and I've considered other measures in addition to this, such that I suffer nothing terrible on account of my granting that I am a sophist. Other unspecified precautionary measures, hmm, Protagoras doesn't disagree, then, with the other sophists that caution is needed. He just thinks that they went about it in a, in a ham-handed way. After all, he begins his first speech in the whole dialogue by noting that a foreign sophist like him, who comes into cities and, and convinces the young people to study with him rather than their own kin, they run a great risk. He even mentions what he calls ill will and hostile plots against sophists. Now, I stress this opening scene between Socrates and Protagoras for a simple reason. Protagoras, I think, is telling Socrates, and by extension us, that he may not be entirely frank in, what he's, in what's to come, or that he too uses precautionary measures or cloaks, but more effective ones than his predecessors had used. And here we already get a sense of Protagoras' immense cleverness. His very confession of concealment or subterfuge takes the form of a statement of his perfect frankness. We'll have to be on our toes, I think, as we listen to Protagoras. So what then does Protagoras claim to teach? After some delay, Protagoras says that he teaches, quote, good counsel concerning one's own affairs and concerning the affairs of the city, how the student might be the most powerful in carrying out and speaking about the city's affairs. It seems to me there are two things at work here how to manage your own affairs well, which is obviously good for you, and how to be the most powerful in political affairs. But for whose good exactly? Again, your own good or, or the city's good? Is what Protagoras claims to teach here thoroughly public-spirited or thoroughly selfish? He doesn't say. But Socrates immediately forces on him the nicest, the most polite interpretation possible. You mean you teach the political art and make men good citizens? And Protagoras gives a cagey answer. That, Socrates, is the very thing I profess or publicly announce. But is what he professes or publicly announces what he says in private? We don't yet know. Does Protagoras offer to teach you how to be a good public servant, say? Or how to dominate at home and abroad? To be the numero uno? Now, Socrates doesn't press him on this very delicate question, but instead he says, wonderful Protagoras, good citizenship, how nice. There's just one problem. I, Socrates, have always been of the view that good citizenship, the, the giving of good political advice, that's not really teachable. When it comes to some question of technical expertise, say the construction of nuclear weapons, to give a modern example, then our politicians listen to the relevant expert, experts, but when it comes to the use of those weapons, that's a strictly political question, and all citizens, without exception, are, are allowed to have a say, at least in a direct democracy like Athens. So from this fact, Socrates concludes that political virtue or expertise, which uh, Protagoras claims to teach, can't be taught. Otherwise, we would demand to hear only from those expert in it. But in fact, we let all citizens have a say. So says Socrates. Now, by raising the question of whether what Protagoras claims to teach is teachable at all, Socrates leaves untouched the, the sensitive question 
of the goodness of what he teaches or its true character. And this opens the door for Protagoras to give a dazzling set speech to the crowd, not only to Socrates, but to everyone there. His famous speech concerning nothing less than the origin of the human species, what he himself calls a myth rather than an ar argument or logos, a myth concerning the adventures of Prometheus and Epimetheus. And I want to devote the rest uh, of today's lecture to Protagoras's justly famous myth. Now, the outline of the myth can be sketched pretty easily, I think. Once upon a time, there were gods, but no mortal species. But when it came time for the gods to make these mortal species out of earth and fire, they ordered two titan brothers, Prometheus and Epimetheus, to distribute to the several species the various powers they need in order to live. Now, unfortunately, Epimetheus, his name means afterthought, Epimetheus successfully begged Prometheus, whose name means forethought, to let him distribute all these powers to the mortal species. And this he did pretty well. Epimetheus, Mr. Afterthought, distributed all the powers, things like flight, speed, strength, size, and so on, to the non-rational animals, such that the species could survive. Prometheus, Forethought, then came along to inspect things. And what did he see? None of the powers or capacities remained for human beings. They'd all been used up for the other animals. We human beings were naked, unshod, no natural bedding, no natural weapons. So in response to this crisis, Prometheus steals both the technical arts or crafts and fire from the gods Hephaestus and Athena. And with these stolen goods, human beings were able to survive. We may not have claws or, or th horns, but we learned to make our own weapons. But we still lacked something we very much needed, what Protagoras calls political wisdom, or the knowledge of how to live together. Only Zeus, he says, king of the gods, possessed that knowledge. Accordingly, when we did come together, we fell to killing one another and committing other terrible injustices right away. So then, out of his fear that the human race might perish entirely, Zeus ordered Hermes, the messenger god, to give justice and a sense of shame to all human beings. Anybody incapable of sharing injustice and a sense of shame has to be killed as a kind of illness plaguing the cities, as Zeus decrees it. Now, I think we could agree that this is certainly an intriguing myth, but what in the world does it have to do with the problem that Socrates posed? Namely, can political expertise or political virtue really be taught? Well, this is Protagoras' answer after telling this, this myth. All citizens in a community, he says, are permitted to give political advice, not because they suppose that there is no teachable expertise, no, as Socrates suggested, but because all are supposed to possess that expertise already. What Protagoras here calls justice and the rest of political virtue. After all, according to Prometheus' myth, uh, Zeus ga ga gave all human beings a share in justice. One clear implication of this is the good sense that democracy makes. If everybody has the virtue or the excellence they need to be good citizens, again, justice and the rest of political virtue, why shouldn't all participate in politics? So here, Protagoras, speaking in Athens, in effect praises Athenian democracy. Now, there is just one problem with this nifty myth and its implication. If Zeus already instilled in us what we need to participate in politics, what good would the high-priced instruction of Protagoras do us? Hasn't Protagoras just done more damage to his cause than, than Socrates did? The myth about Prometheus, Epimetheus, and Zeus doesn't obviously help Protagoras. So I think this is very strange. It's to solve this problem that Protagoras will now proceed to argue that virtue is in fact teachable. And, no surprise, that he, of course, can teach it. According to Protagoras, everybody thinks that virtue is teachable. Why? Because while people don't get angry at those who are small or weak or ugly, as he says, because it's not their fault, so we don't blame them, people do get angry at those who are unjust or impious. Why? Because we suppose that being that way is their fault. They could, 
and they should be otherwise. Everybody is of the opinion, then, that justice and the rest of political virtue is teachable. As Protagoras points out, first the family and then the political community with its laws, they teach us how to behave, how to be just. And as Protagoras doesn't hesitate here to stress, that education, so-called, is achieved by such things as spankings when we're young and beatings or, or the threat of imprisonment when we're older. And if there happen to be a few, like, like Protagoras, say, who can advance the teaching of virtue beyond what either family or the city can accomplish, then by all means we should, we should make use of them. So that is the core of the message, the, the surface message, I think, of Protagoras' long speech, which includes his myth. Now, I've already suggested that Protagoras is an immensely clever speaker who understood himself to be able to conceal his true thoughts, partly for his own safety. So let me try to state, frankly, what Protagoras can only hint at to his potential students in the room. Alcibiades among them, remember. My general suggestion is this. Protagoras here intimates the truth of what he really teaches, even as he shores up the conventional opinions that he and his students will exploit in their quest to become, quote, most powerful. It seems that Protagoras believes of Zeus not only that he exists, but that he's a, a philanthropic lawgiver, a Zeus who cares for the, the whole human race, and who in his care for us gave justice and shame, a sense of shame to everybody, and therefore made political life possible. Because anyone who isn't just has to be killed. But in truth, even if we ignore the fact that all of this is explicitly a myth, the details of it suggest a rather darker picture of the human condition. Zeus cares for the human race, yes, but he's indifferent to the fate of, of individuals, of you and me and Aunt Sally. His concern for the race extends only that it not perish entirely, as the text, text says. And such care as he did exercise took the form of entrusting our well-being to two bunglers, because even the, pr the prudence of Prometheus didn't prevent him from allowing Epimetheus, afterthought, to distribute the powers which left us essentially uh, naked and exposed. As Protagoras presents it, the world is fundamentally Epime Epimethean. That is, thought follows rather than precedes creation. If you like, there is no intelligent design at work here. Creation is not the product of forethought. The only protection, the only comforts we have, were invented by us through arts that we designed and devised. We attained fire through an act of rebellion against the supposed gods. I could put it this way. Our true condition, as Protagoras presents it, is one of utter abandonment. There's only the natural order that at most or best favors the continuation of the species. That's it. Even the brood animals are better off by nature than we are. We don't, we don't have natural defenses the way they do, and they can come together easily to form communities, herds, and so on. We, we human beings, we began to slaughter one another almost as soon as we got together. And to restrain ourselves, to make political life possible, it was necessary not that Zeus actually become a lawgiver, but that all believe him, believe him to have done so. I make this suggestion. Protagoras' myth puts before our eyes the kind of co conviction that human beings have to have if they're going to restrain themselves enough to form political communities. They have to believe that there's a powerful judge watching over them at all times. But then again, this isn't quite correct, because Protagoras notes, as if in passing, that not all human beings are just and that it would be madness to admit to one's injustice or to fail to pretend to be just. He doesn't say that it would be madness to be unjust. And he fails to mention the, the sort of fatal wrath of Zeus striking down these unjust people. Political societies don't in fact require the universal agreement that justice is good or that the gods punish the unjust. It's enough if most people believe this. Political society will endure just fine if there's only a few people who understand the truth about justice and the truth about Zeus, especially if these few also happen to be clever enough to conceal their true thoughts by, by using devices like myth, for example. 
So I suggest to you that in the final analysis, Protagoras may be a teacher of injustice, of the superiority of injustice to justice. It remains to be seen next time what Socrates will make of this rather nasty suggestion.